Welcome everybody to the Disaster Resilience Analytics Center seminar series at Wichita State University. And uh, today's talk, uh, Nathan Filbert, my colleague, is going to introduce the speaker. So I'll hand over to Nathan. Yes, welcome everybody. We are excited today to have with us Dalton Stanfield, a native of Sedgwick County, uh, who grew up in Garden Plain and attended Wichita State University, studying international business, economics, and biological sciences with a minor in chemistry. He then attended Florida State University, where he studied theoretical ecology and evolution and graduated with a master's in ecology. From there, he's moved to Las Vegas, Nevada, where he manages his own environmental consulting firm, specializing on work with endangered species and impacts of infrastructure projects. He works daily with multiple stakeholders and has worked on several fire recovery projects in California. We had the pleasure of meeting him earlier this semester, Atri and I, and talking about the work of DRAC or the R Center, as well as especially his work with policy and stakeholders in climate work. Today's presentation, as you can see, is called Natural Calamities and will draw on the history of water on Earth and man's interaction with it, um, with case studies and from different perspectives, exploring new ways to think about emergency situations and how our perspectives can lead us to effective and surprising solutions. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Dalton, and thank you so much for joining us. No problem, Nathan. Um, so just a heads up for everyone. I had a little bit of trouble trying to figure out what to discuss with you all. And so um, with this presentation, I really want to try to influence people's ways of thinking about a problem. Um, I'm not sure how you all have approached many of these things, but uh, as someone who works with the public a lot, uh, we find there's patterns and things that emerge and just these contradictory views. And so sometimes if we walk it back and try to remove some of the complexity from it and look at things that are very like boil at a very like simplistic level, we start to see like, oh, like this sort of makes sense. And it hopefully can be used to help other people and like communications with the public. It'll be a little interesting. We're on for a wild ride. <laughs> so first off, I just wanted to let you all know, like, this is about what I do. Um, so I'm a wildlife biologist and uh, conservationist, but also a consultant. So whenever we do like infrastructure projects or other sorts of developments in areas where we have sensitive species. I normally go in and I perform surveys. I deal with relocation of animals, health assessments, baseline data. Um, you know, we, we got a desert tortoise, which is a federally threatened species. We got, these were screech owls that uh, a uh, tree company that was trimming hazard trees accidentally chopped down and there was a nest inside of it. So I had to relocate the nest. We got a Stevens kangaroo rat here. They're federally threatened as well, native to the grasslands of the uh, Inland Empire of California. Uh, so sort of like what we have. Um, and I do lots of surveys. This is actually what I'm doing right now, which is trapping for diurnal ground squirrels. They're a rare species that live in the desert um, and they're very trap shy. So it's a lot of labor <laughs> to do it. Um, but also, I work a lot with infrastructure projects and power, especially. So how power gets from one place to another. This picture on your left, actually, is a lot of fun because this area right here, these power lines, this is a creek bed that had been dry for the last six years. This year, due to the torrential rain, was flowing. So we replaced these poles. They were just little buddy ones with um, a better concrete cylinder so that they, when the water goes through, it doesn't wash it out like it would have. 
I also do a lot with fire recovery. This is after a fire. You see lovely <laughs> holes just barely hanging on there. Um, but a lot of the times I spend dealing with construction and making sure when they go into an area that their actions don't adversely affect the environment any more than they have to. The minimization of your impacts um, and your work areas and just standard good practices, good housekeeping is like we like to say. Um, and in the desert, one of the big ones is the desert tortoise. It's one of the few animals that doesn't care about humans. And so it'll just walk right on up and hide underneath the truck. Uh, and then people run over them and then they get in trouble. So that's a lot of my job. Now, with wildfire recoveries, you see I deal with a lot of them. Sometimes it involves taking power lines that are along uh, hillsides on the other sides and moving them closer to roads um, after a fire goes through. This allows for easier maintenance, easier recovery, and easier just preventing future fires. Um, just some fun pictures of all the lovely burned landscapes <laughs> I interact with. Um, this last year, I didn't have any fires, though, which was really nice, only partially because most of California burned by that point in time. Um, and so when thinking about this, I tried to look at what is an emergency in the broadest sense. And my favorite example is like an emergency, you know, to a, some people breaking a nail is your emergency meanwhile for a farmer in kansas they'll sit there and watch tornadoes in their field and not feel any sort of threat they'll just watch it because it's normal well when we look at it an emergency is an event outside an expected range of outcomes so it's something we don't expect to happen um but to expect something you need to have a frame of reference and so is the frame of reference for our emergencies properly informed. And so this comes really back to what do we know about the area we're living in? And what's your perspective of the area? And so for humans, we don't have the best perspective. Because, well, you know, if we look at this, like, what is the actual emergency to this person with their broken nails? This is an emergency. Is that an actual emergency? No, that's a really bad perspective. Because this person most likely has never actually like experienced hardship or change in their life. So therefore, emergencies not used well in that sense. Meanwhile, to most of us, the farmer would have thought of a farmer doesn't think it's an emergency. Us going, it's a tornado. This is an emergency. Again, perspective. Where is a normal outcome for you? Something you expect. Well, for humans, our natural calamities normally are like fire, flood, drought, hurricane, tornado, earthquake, volcano. This either extreme weather or a geological process are our emergencies and occasionally chemical imbalances. This could deal more with like your pollution, um, such as like acid rain, fertilizers. Um, in the natural world, one of the biggest chemical imbalances we have that we're, we could create an emergency or great change from is the oxygenation of the atmosphere during the Carboniferous period, which changed a lot of things. But What's the perspective of humans? We have short attention spans, extremely short. Um, and there's this underlying belief within our society that tomorrow will be like today. It's stagnant, not changing. Um, and that when we have natural emergencies, like we like to use the words like one in a hundred year flood, 500 year flood, the once in a generation, once in a lifetime, all these like, definitions and ways to describe natural events that make them seem like they are unexpected and not going to happen again. But they do. <laughs> and there's also this weird thing within man that makes us look like we have exist above or outside of the natural processes of our world that we've conquered it. You know, we build our cities and nature is out there. We're in here. Um, and that anything that nature throws at us can be dealt with that we can deal with it and you'll see that that's really not the case um and one of my favorite things to point out to people is our life expectancy so 
our country, you know, was founded in the late 1700s. We see the life expectancy for the people there, 35, maybe 40 years once you get into the late 1800s. These are all numbers based off of uh, UN studies. Um, so, and based on UN studies. And until recently, you know, within the last hundred years, we've essentially doubled our life expectancy for people, which is fascinating. But it means that all of a sudden, people who are 70, 80, 90 year old, 90 year, 90 years old are now existing when they never used to exist before in our society. <laughs> There's this whole new like class. And with it comes them having a lot of information or lived experiences. And so um, just to show you how like short-sighted some of our thinking was. So the Mortgage Act of 1948, which was created mortgages uh, based on, because the mortgages first entered the market in the 30s, uh, basically as banks could try to take advantage of people, they were like, hey, we'll lend you money during the Great Depression. And if you can't pay back, we get your property. So these banks were making all these loans underneath the core assumption that this house would be there at the end of it. That this property would still be there at the end of it. Um, and if we look at like, okay, 1940, you know, 48, it's like right here, the people born at that point in time were only expected to live 55 years. Born. But a mortgage was 30 years. This is a very, eh, it'll, I'll have it till I die. Very short look at time and space. Well, in dealing with all of our issues, all this, we tend to go to different types of, inf different types of ways to mediate our, our, how do I say this? Mediate the environment on our property, our areas. And a lot of times we invest in what are called gray infrastructure, which by the name is concrete based. Um, you know, we think of sewage water treatment plants. We see, this is a picture of the channelization of the Los Angeles River. This is what the river looks like. There is not a living thing to be seen here. It is all concrete, gray infrastructure. Um, now a lot of places are starting to implement more of what's called green infrastructure which is uh, like in Las Vegas, we have a complete artificial wetland that was created to filter stormwater. Um, it was built because Las Vegas itself, if you don't know, Las Vegas means the meadows because um, Las Vegas used to be a meadow. And when we built over it, the meadow was destroyed. <laughs> There's a small section of it left called the Springs Preserve. And in fact, uh, where I live in Vegas, uh, there used to be a river that run down that ran down the street. There used to be a, an opening in the median, but too many people got drunk and fell into it. So they covered it up and filled it in. So there's no longer this little creek that runs near my house, which is very sad. Um, but we built these artificial wetlands to serve as a form of water filtration because we could not handle what was happening with our sewage and water treatment plants for when it did rain. If you don't know about Las Vegas, Las Vegas is a valley. There is, and where the Flamingo Hotel is located at is basically the, back, the very center bottom. And every time it rains in Las Vegas, the first floor of the, Las, of the Flamingo Hotel parking garage floods. Every single time and it's really funny because when you're in vegas and it rains it smells like a wet dog because there's not enough water to really clean off all the just nastiness it's just smooths it around it's not very fun um and some cities now are starting to learn about rain gardens storm runoff gardens these areas where we've put plants and stuff like that that have deep root systems that are able to absorb the water and put it into the ground this takes off the stress on our gray infrastructure, which costs billions of dollars to maintain. 
while most of your natural ecosystems, once you build it, they're pretty self-containing. They just do their natural processes. Well, in natural communities, view of our calamity, such as fire, flood, drought, is very different than ours. Ours is a, like I said, it's a once in a generation, oh my God, we got to do all these extra things and come up with all these extra ways to fix things. And it's like, do we? Well, nature tends to view our natural calamities very different. Calamities are just disturbances. They're perturbations in the natural succession of an ecological community. Um, they basically turn back the clock on how the community has progressed to an apex community. Um, they're very cyclical in a lot of natures. Um, and just so you all, oops, here we go. Here is essentially what I'm trying to get at. Succession is the process in which we have a disturbance such as a fire. We have annual plants reemerge, grasses, perennials, intermediate species, and the climax community. Typically, your climax community uh, has the largest amount of biomass, while your intermediate communities, these ones right here, have the largest amount of biodiversity. There's a lot of thoughts as to why. Some of us, and there's a lot of debate on it. In my professional opinion, the reason why a lot of the intermediate our intermediate communities are more diverse is because you have those that were suited for early recovery emerging in large populations and they start dying off while at the same time your climax community plants and animals are starting to emerge so you have this transition time the teeter-tottering between two different species so that's what we call secondary succession where we already had a living landscape that was disturbed fire flood hurricane those sorts of things then we have something called primary succession, which is volcanoes, landslides, uh, earthquakes, the, the geological processes that um, expose bare rock. So, you know, like a volcano, lava rock, there's got no life to it. Um, and this process takes hundreds upon thousands of years for it to go from bare rock to a climax community. while your normal, your primary, your secondary ones are, it can take a few years, maybe 150 years if you want like giant sequoias. But like a lot of the times we're completely fine with this intermediate sort of successional trajectory because the community itself is built to constantly replace itself. Okay. Okay. So what I do and what I find useful is in land use planning, we need to identify what kind of community type we have. Do we have a climax community or an intermediate? Uh, old growth forests are obviously a climax, uh, a climax community. Coral reefs tend to be, mangrove coasts tend to be climaxes. It, normally a climax community is characterized by large trees large slow growing trees those are the biggest indicators of the climax community while like in the prairie we live in what's called a intermediate um a constant cycle of disturbance is occurring whether it's fires tornadoes droughts these cycles are constantly occurring within the landscape we don't think they are but the evolution of the community says that it is because they are well adapted to this constant uh, cyclical nature of disturbance. And then there's the deserts, which are a climax community to an extent, but they're also um, how should I say, like a they are a community uh, that's done the best it can is the way I like to look at it um given its resources or the amount of water availability okay that's a little over there. so what are ways we can use to identify the disturbance regimen in our community well one of the favorite ones is dendrology tree rings will tell you so much about the landscape it will input this back data that we don't know about. 
What was the normal fire routine? How often did we have fires in this area? Naturally. And, you know, sometimes they're not natural. But if we can establish a normal pattern, it can help us influence the ways in which we go about managing our systems. How often do we need to burn? Um, And one way of looking at this is if we have a fire scar and then we have, you know, rainy season growth, and then if we have one band of rainy season growth and then they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until there's a fire, that shows that this area gets a lot of moisture one year, followed by several years of lower moisture until the area or landscape is so dry, it burns. This can be used to influence or predict when our forest is going to burn. How often do we need to burn it? But it can also point out to like, how often do we get the rain we need to fill our reservoirs? The forest tells me we're on a 20 year cycle. I planned for a two year cycle because my pool of data was only the last 10 years. Well, these can help influence things. We also do wetland delineations. This one I found on a company's webpage that made me very angry. So just so we all know, wetland delineation is where we say, where is it wet? And the U.S. government is constantly, the federal, is constantly changing the definition of what is wet based on what administration is in charge. Because there's no formal rule, it's an interpretation. And so the agencies and those elected officials at the presidential level can change the interpretation of things when there's no formal law. Does that make sense? Um, so, so underneath Obama, we uh, wetlands were protected within 15 feet of an, a wetland delineation. There's an initial 15 feet buffer. When Trump came to office, he removed it. He's like, we only have to protect what's wet. And so that buffer zone was removed from the delineation. And so therefore, when we people do projects like this office development with all the parking in the world, the yellow is the new delineation. The red is the old. We change the rules. We change the amount of stuff we have to protect. We change the amount of stuff we have to protect. We change the mitigation requirements. I do wetland delineations. I tend to be a little bit more on the conservative side when it comes to like, yeah, that's wet. (laughs) Because when you infill a wetland, where does the water go? It's like setting yourself up to fail. Um, Also, when we look at ecologists, uh, we can look at life cycles of plants and animals to understand their regimen or how they grow. This is a bristlecone pine. They live to be two, 3,000 years old. They're extremely slow living, extremely slow growing. To me, this points to this is an extremely low productivity environment. Well, yeah, they only live above, I think, 6,000 feet uh, above sea level in mountains where it's gravel around you. That's it. So they've adapted a lifestyle, which means there's a low carrying capacity. So if we put a bunch of people up here, there's not enough water resources to live here. This, the landscape tells you that. I know it seems sort of, sort of like uh, straightforward. And I feel like a lot of what I'm going to say feels very straightforward. But you'd be surprised the amount of people who ignore it. Um, you can also look at age structures of a population. So this is a sugar maple. And one of my favorite stories is uh, about one of my friends who went and did wetland delineation. Uh, and he was in section of forest and all the sugar maples were short saplings except for one of them one of them was really big so you're looking around you're going why why is it like this and then you realize that sugar maples don't like water uh waterlogged soils they don't like them they need well draining soils well this one tree was on a hill in the middle of this forest all the rest weren't Well, that one tree was much older and all the other ones were less than 10 years of age, which tells me that forest flooded within the last 10 years because it killed all the other trees. 
So a good biologist or ecologist is able to, especially a botanist, is really able to read the history of the landscape through the plants. Um, we also can analyze, and you know, one of my favorite ones is uh, weather patterns affecting uh, trees and stuff like that. And you know, on TikTok and that, everyone's like, you need to shake your fiddle leaf big so it will, you know, develop strong branches and it likes it because it simulates wind. And when I was in grad school, we had Hurricane Irma come through. Oh, not Hurricane Irma. Her Hurricane Hermione hit Tallahassee. Hurricane Hermione had wind gusts up to 40 miles per hour. For anyone who lives in Kansas, we're like, what? That's, that's an average day. That's fine. Well, that forest had not experienced 40 mile per hour winds for the last 25 years. And so when that storm hit, it took over a month for them to clean up all the fell trees that were just in the road. Their entire sidewalks ripped up because the entire tree line was ripped up because the forest had never experienced it. And so if you're awake, so the forest never experienced above 20 mile per hour winds for the last 25 years. And now here's 40, it's all gonna be ripped down. So understanding like your normal ranges within a landscape can help you predict what's going to happen. All of us biology and ecology majors, we're like, we're going to the, we're going to the science building because we have backup generators and keys and we're staying there for the next couple of days. Well, everyone else said, oh, it's just a tropical storm. We'll be fine. Well, most of you didn't have power for a month because this tropical storm did something outside the normal. Um, you can also look at uh, evolutionary adaptations. This is a lungfish. They're native to Australia and Africa. Um, they completely dry out and they form a little cocoon and live in the ground for a while. If lungfishes can, on average, can live two to five years in this state, that means for a water planning mindset, you need to know you need at least five years of water stored up before another water event occurs. Because the lungfish don't live past five years, but they're still here. So that shows that enough of the landscape gets water in a five-year rotation to support this species continued existence and then you can do vegetation mapping which is like i said earlier one of my favorite things to do it tells you the story of the landscape if you see this picture right now this is the nile this is it's uh the main stretch of it and then this is all where it spills out it's floodplain we know that normally it would meander back and forth as silt built up and just bring with it fertile grasses, fertile life, hence, you know, Egypt. So all these are tools that an ecologist has in their toolbox to pull out, to try to understand what's happening in the environment. We look at animals, we look at age structures, we look at adaptations, we look at wetland maps, we look at tree rings which i love doing it's so much fun and what does this say to all of us well it says that after a calamity or event the ecological communities have evolved to restore themselves because these things are cyclical they are constant and just because they might occur outside our original 30-year lifespan when we started making policy and introducing all these different acts. We have, there's the Wetland Act that was introduced in the 1800s where we restrained wetlands left and right because we've wanted them for agricultural land, not knowing that these areas flood every 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and so when we have these disasters and we want to build resilience, we need to reinstall the software for the landscape that rebuilds itself. We've removed it in a lot of cases. And so, like we said, like I said, you know, cyclical nature of disturbance and evolution, disturbances rip through communities and act as an agent of selection. When the same disturbance occurs again, those community members that survived originally have passed on their beneficial traits to their offspring. And as a result, communities more adapted to recovering from that disturbance. Adaptation, you know, 
in biology and ecology, you know, some people, there are some instances where selective pressures are constant. And so uh, an animal is always kept in this ecological niche over here. But there's growing evidence to suggest that selection is not constant, or there are very few cases in which it acts constantly. It is instead these bursts of selection that occur throughout the landscape, normally brought on by a disturbance. So now I want to talk, what does it mean for humans? We have, I've outlined that ecological communities, no disturbance. We can go into the community, we can identify traits, features, all these things that show us these disturbances are happening again and again. We can even give you rough timelines of what it would be like or what the landscape had experienced over the last 100, 200 years, way before we ever started recording stuff or really recording stuff. Because a lot of our records pre-1900 are like, mm -hmm. I shot in the dark uh, for some of these areas. Well, human. before we get to that, everyone think of a forest and think what it looks like, what it is. And let's think about human communities and what they look like. Our human communities, like we have cell phones, we have highways, we have apartment buildings. That's a really bad picture. What are all these? Also, we also have cars, stuff like that. All these are rocks. They're just rocks. They're fancy rocks, but they're rocks. Rocks don't adapt to the landscape. They just exist within it. So in order to adapt, you have to be alive. None of this is alive. Even though we have really fancy things like phones and AI, none of it's alive. They're all rocks. Okay? So if you think about that, they're all rocks. That means when we go into a city or a landscape that had evolved to exist within this stretch, the grasses and perennials, maybe even small annuals, to your climax community, which normally could take 100 years, we instead reset the community to this, our bare rock. Our bare rock community will take hundreds, if not thousands of years to reach the same sort of sustainability that it was. This is bad. <laughs> because, and like, there's evidence to support this. The animals you see in human settlements are cockroaches. They're pigeons. They're, this is an LA coyote. They're rats. They're animals we are going to find in rocky, barren landscapes in caves. Caveman, our house is a cave. It's a very fancy cave, but it's a cave. It's not living especially when we put turf around it and it's absolutely worse. And I remember when peregrine falcons came back to Chicago, this was a big deal. Well, peregrine falcons normally nest on the side of mountains because we've made a sterile mountainside community in the city. Like that's what it is. Now, rural places don't get off any better. Rural America has replaced complex, complex communities with channelized channels and monocultures. Um, many of these systems, for just the sake of one very key aspect, is our root systems. We have obliterated the soil and our root systems. These are your non-natives, not very deep. This is your fescue turf. Look at that root system. It is normally an inch or less deep, okay? And then your natives are over here where they can get feet, feet deep, 16, 24, 30 feet deep. Anyone who's walked into a prairie uh, educational display about our prairie grasses and stuff like that, especially in Kansas, will have seen the root systems are dynamic. They are so cool to study um and i would almost say that the root systems are much like you could probably put them on a graph and it would be like we have different layers of the canopy we would also have different layers of our root structures and how they divvy out the landscape it's just it's really hard to study those but i would not be surprised if you would end up with similar situations um and then here are our Agricultural products, 
many of our agricultural products don't go deep at all with their root systems. Um, and this has an effect on water, water recharge, aquifers, all of that. Because when your root systems aren't going that deep, and instead what's going deepest is your blade for tilling, all you're doing is compacting the soil beneath wherever it's being disrupted. And so you've rem essentially taken something that used to be good soil and almost made it into like a bedrock again through repeated action. So now that we've learned that basically we have built an entire landscape that is not adapted to absorb water, that is not adapted to utilize water, now we're going to talk about the water and the crises we currently escalate, we currently experience. So this is an aerial picture of Houston. Okay. If you look at that, you see a lot of gray things. And if you were to do a topographical map of Houston, Houston is a cereal bowl. It is an indent in the ground that we have lined with concrete where no water will go. And so every time we have hurricanes or torrential downpours, it floods in Houston because we have, you know, the old, uh, the old saying of the, um, the crow who figured out how to get water out of a bucket. He just puts pebbles in it again and again and again until it reaches the top and he can get it. Well, that's what we've done. We have filled in a sink, a hole, a sink for water that used to be wetlands with rocks and fescue, which does nothing. And so therefore we have to invest heavily in sewage treatment plants. Um, and one of my favorite things is we humans argue about what rocks we can put where. Okay, we argue about where can we put the rocks where one family lives and where can we put the rocks where two families live? Where can we put the rocks where I sell stuff? Where do we put the rocks where I build things, where I work? Where do we put all these rocks? This is a very poor way of interpreting land use. This comes down to our planning departments, our urban planners, our city planners. All these guys are city commissioners, especially after the pandemic. We've all realized that a lot of the areas we work in, our office buildings aren't necessary. They're absolutely pointless. And every urban planner who studied, uh, any academic urban planner has found that like when we segregate out our cities and specialize them in certain areas, like, oh, this is the commerce section. This is where we live. This is blah, blah, blah. Well, when we split it up that way, it makes theft easier. Crime rates go up. Economic issues and urban sprawl go up this is mm, we need to be a much more dense area of society we must build on top of each other um you know we also have to have huge fields and other places where we have energy production uh recycling plants garbage disposals all these things are these massive investments of time and money to take care of processes that happened naturally <laughs> just because we didn't understand. And when I say we, I mean predominantly Europeans when they came to the States. Um, so like I said, land functions. Here in human settlements, zoning laws, we have all these zones where we argue about where we can put what kind of rocks. And if any of you have ever seen a city parks and rec or a city commission room meeting, that's life. That's real life. I have gone to those where people are in tears because they don't want an apartment complex next to their building. Tears. Their voice is quivering. They have no idea how to contain themselves. And you go, well, where are people going to live? And so we've done this and we have the way I like to look at it is we have created a highly specialized plots of land where 
we might think it's efficient, but if we looked at the landscape, it isn't efficient. It's better to be like a wetland where we have a little bit of everything happening everywhere. There are homes being provided for many habitat for many different creatures. We're filtering water from brackish to clean. We are taking out pollutants that occur. We are putting water back in the aquifer. We are absorbing wind. We are absorbing all these natural elements within this. We're providing food. What, where's food grown in Houston? It isn't. It's grown somewhere else. All these functions are happening in the natural landscape in one area. Yes, we can't go somewhere and be like, this area right here is where all of X, Y, and Z happens. No, it happens everywhere. It's a constant little bit of everything everywhere all at once. You know, fun movie. Um, and so when it comes to climate change, climate change is essentially increased CO2 in the atmosphere, which is an increased capacity for the atmosphere to hold water vapor and energy. But at the same time we've done this, we have also decreased the capacity of the landscape to absorb that energy because rocks don't absorb energy and they don't absorb water. They weather it. They sit there until they break apart. And that's really something that like, it's a good metaphor for our society as and our cities. When we have these natural disasters occur, they weather it until they fall apart because they're rocks. Only life can adapt. Only life can change. Um, and so when we go back to Houston, see the lovely Galveston Bay here. And you see all the sea walls they built. And you see the river as it enters and just disappears. It disappears. So if anything outside of our predicted range that we have a set, which normally most people tend to base their predictive range on an average, and average is an absolute stupid number to base any predictive quality on, because no, I want to know what my highs and lows are for my valley. That's what you want to know. Highs and lows, highs and lows, range. It's the best thing to do. Well, since we've done this, what do we do? We have removed the landscape's ability to absorb water and energy. We've removed it because rocks don't do that. And we've made it so the atmosphere can carry more of that stuff because it's trapped. Well, let's talk about a bit about system science. The system science is in terms of hydrology, okay? System science, you know, we have closed and open systems. A good way of looking at natural disasters are it's water. If there's too much water, we have flooding. If there's not enough water, we have drought and fires. If there's too much water vapor in the atmosphere, we get major hurricanes. It's water. All of this water. <laughs> and so we have to think of things as a system. And how do we modify a system that is essentially semi-open? So if we think about it, it's like we have our open systems and we have closed systems. Closed systems, we know our ins and outs. They're really easy to identify. Open systems are harder. And in an isolated system, nothing gets in or out. Um, there's a lot of work in this field in regards to um, general systems theory, which is where we take um, theory on how systems operate like a cell and apply it towards society. Um, and some of that's been useful, but like at the same time, like our cities, we design them to have special niches in different parts of it, like a cell has different organelles that perform different functions. Um, not the best comparison, but we did it. So in doing that, just think of systems. We want to identify in any system, we want to identify our exits of an important resource and our entrances of that resource. So with water, how does the water get in? How does it get out? Well, water, we all know water comes in through rain, or in some cases, it can also come in through like river systems, rivering snow. Um, and there's also some other tidbits where I would love to use uh, economic theory 
uh, in which we use like the velocity of money, the money multiplier effect to understand like how an area grows in aggregate uh, and like how fast we need to turn over a resource. Because sometimes if we turn a resource over faster in a system, it could lead to it faster leaving. Or if we slow it down, it could mean the resource doesn't leave as fast. Does this sort of make sense? It's you want to slow or speed up, but you have to identify your entrances and exits. Um, so here's a good way to view the world, view the United States. These are hydrological drainages. This pink one right here, that's the Mississippi Basin. This is the Colorado Basin. This right here is Tule Lake basin these are ways in which we can understand or go about looking at our waterways their systems and we understand that anything that falls in here will exit one spot okay so for building drought resiliency what do we want to do we want to slow the rate at which it leaves the system and so we build things like so we do things to slow the system. So let's take the Colorado River Basin, for example. Colorado River Basin, here's a nice map of it. Um, again, the system's semi-closed. Once rain falls, it only has one way to go, out the Gulf to the Gulf of California. Really the only way to go. However, it also is pumped to these areas over here, which get a lot of water from the Colorado River system. And we have built infrastructure that slows the rate at which water leaves the system, but we've also built it to where it increases the rate at which it leaves. So if we think about it, so like, you know, we have Hoover Dam, Glen Canyon Dam, Lake Powell, Lake Meath, giant bodies of water. It has slowed the rate at which water leaves the system. We can hold on to it for a little bit longer. However, we've also channelized so many of our streams to where normally where it would meander somewhere is instead shot out to another place. And so in an area where we have very long water hydrological cycles that go from really wet years to prolonged droughts, you don't want to shove all the water out when it's really wet. And that's currently what California is enduring. And most of the American Southwest are like, what do, we, what do we do? What do we do with all this water? Well, you messed up in your previous planning. Here's another fun one. Here's Tulare Lake. Tulare Lake, if any of you have read about this, is a ghost lake. It has disappeared. Uh, it has been dry since the 80s. Uh, and even in the 80s, it only filled up for about one and a half years. Um, it's this giant, actually, I want to show you all this. Whooped. Not that one. This one. Come on. Ah. So Tulare Lake. Tulare Lake, you guys can, can you guys see my screen still? Or is it not all of it? Sorry. I'm seeing uh, your slide, but the rest of your screen does that make sense uh oh uh, it's still the let me oh wait. you're sharing your screen thank you i'm going to uh did you move share. move a tab or something yes there we go share there we go yep you Got guys it. get this now uh, yep. okay yep. So this is the Tulare Lake bed. And ooh, now I need this to go away. Sorry, I can't see my screen. Ah, this is the Tulare Lake bed. Previous to this year, this is what it looked like. Farmland, agricultural land, there's a few little settlements in there, but it's a 40 mile wide stretch of land that's been dry. And it's really funny. If you look up historical records, um, when we passed the Wetland Reclamation Act, which was to take wetlands and make them into farmland in the 1800s, we used to advertise that there was new beachfront lakefront property because we had slowly been draining the lake 
So every time that happened, we would just put a new row of houses in and label them as waterfront. Well, this is it this year. It's very green because it's just taking the spring, but all this water's come in and more is coming. The this is fed off the Southern Sierras. Uh, and the Southern Sierra still has about 300% water equivalent up there. So it has three years worth of water to melt still, which is above the 80s um, record for the Southern Sierras. So this is going to fill and it's going to fill more. We have already, there are towns in there that will disappear. They will disappear underneath the water. And the water will be there for at least two years, which is another fun tidbit. Um, some people are possibly expecting longer, depending on what the winter weather brings. But again, this goes to show humans at one point were selling this as new beachfront property, and now you are underwater. And yes, this is 2023. The last time it happened was 83, but before that had happened in the 60s. And it happened, uh, I think they said in the 20s as well. So this is a 20 to 40 year cycle of this thing filling back up. And if you speak to any of the native uh, Thule people, uh, they're called Thule's because it's Thule reeds that live there. Um, they, will, there's, uh, they will talk about how uh, one of their last, there were one of their tribal members when Thule Lake was dry, dry, for the first time in her lifetime, she spoke about how she can't wait for it to drown all the white people. <laughs> for the lake to return and take with it all the settlers. <laughs> Very funny. Um, but, there we go. That's Tule Lake. Tule Lake, is the, see, there's towns Conquering, Kettleman, Appala, Allensworth, all these cities exist within a dry lake bed that fills up because it has nowhere to go. When water falls here, there's nowhere to go. There are mountain ranges down here. No, it doesn't go out to sea. This is an example of the landscape. Why would we build houses here? But we did, because we thought we could conquer nature. Um, let me push this back to slideshow. I'm trying. Oh, no, wait. Oh, sorry. Mm. Sorry. I wanted to show you guys that one because that was a very, it's a fun um, concept. It's just a fun thing that we have this entire lake, one of the large, it was the largest lake west of the Mississippi. Um, 40 miles was the di diameter of it and it, we drained it, but it fills up every few years, every 20 years, just about. So, yeah. So, that's true, Larry Lake. There's no outlet. Nothing happens there. So what are our current methods to water management that we implement today? We have several methods. One is dams. We dam it up. We create giant reservoirs to keep the water. We channel it away in times when we don't want to have that water there, and we just shoot it out. And then uh, in 2011, 12, I want to say, um was when the drought was really bad again in California and they put all these little black balls into the reservoirs little black shade balls to slow evaporation because that's the other method in which water leaves our hydrological system evaporation or out to sea that's basically it a little bit of else but that's how it does it these are these are water management methods this is what we do but there's a lot of gray here a lot of gray which is just so sad i hate it um sorry but these are current water methods which again this is gray infrastructure and this doesn't aid in the conservation it deals with a problem in the short term save it for the long term in a giant giant lake or shove it out to water as soon as it gets too high shove it out of the way this is the way we managed it And again, back to the earlier where I stated that we have removed the capacity of the landscape to absorb these resources, we have found that far cheaper and better options is restoration. 
And along the Colorado River, they've been, I love this, they've been bringing beavers back. But because humans removed so many of the beavers and killed them all for furs because they thought they were nuisances or other X, Ys, and Zs, there's not enough beavers to make the beaver dams that help slow the rate at which water leaves the Colorado River Basin system. And so now we have to pay people to go out and build artificial beaver dams. We pay them to make a fake beaver dam because we got rid of the beavers. The same like counterintuitive almost, this sounds silly. Um, we also go into the desert or other landscapes and we scalp the ground for solar panels, which are my nemesis. Um, because when you do this, you again, remove the capacity for the landscape to absorb runoff, to support pollinators, to support really any sort of life. We are taking rocks and stacking them on top of rocks. Like, that's all a solar panel is. It's a fancy rock. But there's positives with, with solar panels. If we didn't use them in such a compact manner and instead implemented more of a tree-like structure, they can actually slow the rate at which evaporation occurs in arid landscapes, which is really cool information. Um, in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, we have a species of fox known as San Joaquin uh, San Joaquin kit fox is a federally listed species. It tends to only live in areas where coyotes don't because coyotes will just murder them. And so when solar panel companies were first putting solar fields in the Central Valley and especially around the Carrizo Plain and stuff like that, they sold the solar panels as a positive to San Joaquin kit boxes because they can get along fine. You know, there's no issue to them, blah, 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 blah. Well, that was the first two years of data. As they started getting more years of data, the third and fourth one, and there's currently high. Yeah. Um, they found that coyotes moved in. And we go, why did coyotes move in? Well, it could be possible that the solar panels have slowed the rate at which water would leave the system in this area through evaporation enough to where underneath these solar panels is a lot of your early successional species, a lot of ones we consider weeds in our noxious weeds in the uh, environmental community because they don't belong there, but they grow fast. And in turn, rabbits and other small uh, mammals have showed up in these areas. And so while the kit fox sort of exists in this niche of very low productivity environment, I can hang on. I can hang on for dear life. And coyotes, they need more. They're bigger animals. It could be possible that the solar panels have modified the landscape enough to now support coyotes in the area, which would be counterintuitive to selling solar panels as a positive thing for an endangered species. Instead, now we have modified the landscape enough to encourage their primary predator to kill them, which is a fascinating hot take on it all. Um, they're still writing with that in the agency, but it's fascinating. So what does this mean? Again, we, have remo we keep removing the capacity for our landscape to deal with natural disasters and disturbances. In Florida, for instance, this is a picture of Miami on your right. I love it. Isn't it pretty? All the concrete that lines the coastline. Um, a study done uh, by people at UC Santa Cruz, I think, or Santa Barbara, um, did a study about mangrove coasts. And they found that there was 25% less damage in areas that had mangrove coasts from hurricanes. 25%, saving billions of dollars in building costs, insurance costs, all this other stuff. And if anybody has read recent news headlines, Florida's basically in so much trouble. They're screwed. Um, because no insurer currently will insure most of the state. The state is mostly insured by itself, which means if another hurricane comes through, 
we've removed all the mangroves, all the wetlands, everything along this coast. So this is just rocks on the beach. That's all it is. It's not going to absorb water. It's going to be flooded. Water's going to sit on top of it. And then all that energy is going to be transported farther inland, making all this area where, you know, normally people would hold policies for hurricanes, but insurancers would rarely pay out because they didn't get hit. All of a sudden now these also are getting hit because we also have increased strength and reduced resiliency within the landscape. We're, we're hitting the nan- we're hitting the problem on both ends and being like, eh, nothing's going to happen. Uh, we can also go, and so what do we do with this? Well, just like in the Colorado River Basin and like in New York after Hurricane Sandy, we put things back that we removed. Oyster bars, grasslands, sandbars, beavers, mangroves, all of this. These are small actions we can take to create more resiliency within the landscape by restoration. And restoration is far cheaper, far, far, far cheaper than these massive seawalls, the massive sewage runoff plants. Um, And so that gets me to the next question or the next sort of idea I have is after we have all these large scale storms and all these issues that arise, And after the landscape, we as humans have this notion, at least in the the public, that we'll just rebuild it. It was a once in a life thing. This won't happen again. I'll be dead before it happens again. So we rebuild it. And that's probably not the best motto to have. We really should have a comprehensive plan for when natural disasters strike and wipe away a portion of area that we've built, what can we restore afterwards? What can we buy people out of land and put it back to the way it was and increase the resiliency within the landscape? By restoring the land and removing all the rocks we put everywhere, all the concrete, all these things. We wish... You know, like, I don't know, we see in the news and we see in engineers and case studies and with engineers and publications, all these new technologies to fix our problems. And it really seems like the most logical thing we need to do is just put things back and learn to not need as much space. The landscape will heal itself with some help uh, and it will recreate create resiliency within our communities because we're a little bit more tightly knit packed together. And therefore it's an odds thing. If you have a giant urban sprawl, you now have so many more points in which you can have these interactions, these horrible events occur. Um, You know, could we, I know in the state of Kansas, if you are hit by a tornado and you get an insurance payout, there's a, bond placed on it a hold on portion of it you won't get all of it until you've proven that you've taken care of your structure because they don't want you taking the money and leaving it abandoned not all states have these measures hurricane area states don't have these measures so you need to there should be policies in place that encourage people to either sell the land or you know rebuild it if it's an area we believe is suitable. Does that make sense? Um, Because like, if you think about Hurricane Katrina, how many abandoned structures still exist around New Orleans? We don't have any system in place to go, okay, like we all know, we all built this stuff. Many of you are gonna leave anyways after a natural disaster. You relocate somewhere else. These things become abandoned. We have no formal process to go, all this stuff's abandoned. We need to tear it up restore it to wetland, restore it to something that's going to absorb water and prevent flooding, prevent natural disaster and calamity from affecting other properties, other portions of our settlements. We have to remove some to improve the other half. It's like 
yeah, it's it's like trying to uh, cut your low hanging fruit. There are properties, there are areas within any city that are highly prone to these natural disasters. We still basically allow the free market to determine whether people live and settle places. But the free market now has really started to turn on this because insurance companies now are losing money. It is now harder to insurance things. In California, most places, most people don't carry fire insurance because it's so expensive that it's it prices them out. Um, and it really comes down to like, how do we identify in a landscape in a city when in which we've destroyed most of our natural records to identify where we need to rebuild stuff to create resiliency within the rest of the city, the landscape, our areas. Um, and so for fires, we already sort of do this. These are our national forests. Um, and here's a map of the San Bernardino National Forest. Um, the This tan color is what's already owned by the Forest Service. The green line slashy stuff is also owned by the Forest Service, but it's designated a wilderness. So we don't allow for development here. And these white areas are private holdings within the Forest Service. So when a large fire goes through and say it like wipes out this area up here, burns it all to the ground, the Forest Service will go in and offer to buy the land off of you. Granted, there have been some people who have said no and then hate the government and make it a problem. But when we do that, we remove this area from being affected by humans. If a fire happens there, it, it happens. It's not something we're going to worry about as much because fire is a natural process to this landscape. And it also removes so many economic factors. I think a lot of people are unaware that the actions of other people have a real consequence on you and what you pay for your stuff, whether it's your, in especially for insurance, like um, for instance, the state of Nevada, Las Vegas, their car insurance rates are some of the highest in the country because at any one point in time, a third of the people on the road don't have insurance on their car. They also are notorious for, um, so they don't have insurance on the car. They also have tourists and also it's Vegas. So everyone is drunk. But Nevada decided too many people were failing the driver's ed test. And so in order to ensure that people got their licenses and we got our tax revenue from their cars, we made the driver's test easier. And then this year I got hit with a 15% blanket raise for every auto insurance co policy in, in the city. These, these choices of other people or our choices to make things easier for them to build, develop, infill have real consequences to the landscape and the resiliency of keeping my home safe or my thing safe. And so there are areas where we really should be just designating them as no build zones. Stay away. Let this area be flooded. Let it be X, Y, and Z. But we don't we don't do that. We let people do what they want. And then we let them get insurance or not. It isn't until recently that these insurance rates have become more of a thing. But moral of the story. We need to learn to build denser, be multi-purpose within our settlements. Um, we need better land use planning because we're so bad at it. It's terrible. Um, restoration, restoration, restoration. I can't say it enough. If there's a problem in your community and it's something that's tied to a biological force, it's because we've removed something that has made it gone haywire. So put it back. So that way we don't have to pay people to go build artificial beaver dams to keep ourselves from drying out. We could have just had beavers there to begin with. They would have fixed it. Um, and then one of the biggest thing is learn from native practices for your area. 
colonialists removed many of the native peoples from their land. Native people had a fundamental understanding of the way the land worked, how to operate it, how to do things with it. We've removed it and treated the land like we would wherever we came from, which is England for a lot of people, or Germany, which is a very different sort of landscape. A little bit more predictive, not as disturbance prone, if I think right, in certain areas um, versus like gradual cycles. And so what we've learned, especially the more we've gone on with stuff, is that we need to go back to our native practices. We need to listen to them. We need to talk to them. And we need to understand what they did in order to prove resiliency within the landscape. Um, but like one of the biggest things is, you know, Smokey the Bear, no forest fires. And then, you know, all the natives are over there in California being like, we burned multiple times. Why aren't you burning? And now we have all these mega fires. And it's really interesting, someone who's worked on a lot of these fire recoveries. We overlay past fires on a map. And we're like, this is where a fire started. Where's it going to go? And we can almost to a T say, well, it'll stop here because this fire burned five years ago. There's not much fuel there. And almost to a T, it stops. It burns itself out on that ridge. And so last year was sort of nice. I didn't have a lot of fires because so much of the state burned. There wasn't much left to burn. If it was, it was small fires, small patches. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we had this mindset of keeping things, preserving things. The European mindset is to preserve, to keep things as they are, same, stagnant, everlasting. And many natives understood that that's not possible. Constant cyclical patterns is what we rely upon over long periods of time. But you have to understand the landscape and live there for probably thousands of years before your society itself probably develops that culture. In Europe, it's I, I can't speak for certainty or truth, but it'd be an interesting idea to study or look at the mentality of Europeans when it comes to landscape use. It is it tied to the fact that like they didn't have a lot of extreme disturbances. They had constant cyclical or constant easy patterns, not major, you know, hurricanes, tsunamis, fires. Did they have these? I don't hurricanes hitting Europe. Does that even happen? Meanwhile, that's a constant thing on our earth front. Um, so yeah. Oh, and then here's just, you know, this is what our modern farmland looks like. That, you know, we don't call that channelized, but that is channelized because it's no longer allowed to flow frequent across the landscape to meander. And it could be that, you know, we institute new rules that are much more in, uh, based in conservation and putting things back. I don't know. I, I, I really wanted to try to lead everyone in this direction that our communities are, our cities, our developments are these areas where primary succession has to occur again. And so we have to recreate all these natural processes that exist already in the landscape, but we've pushed many of the species or organisms to the brink of extinction to where they don't function that way anymore. And now we have to take on that burden. That burden is financially expensive, it's labor intensive. There's just, it's not a good thing. Why, why can't we just put things back and let them do it for free? Um, there's a study, there was a, a, a study, an economic study about a valley in China, if I remember right, that all the bees died. They didn't have any more bees. And so they hand pollinated everything. And the first year, everyone was super excited because they had one of the highest crop yields ever. Because hand pollination is very effective, but it's very labor intensive. Within a few years, they had no one around who was willing to do the pollinating because all the young people left. So now you all had all these old people that were like, no one wants to pollinate. No one wants to walk around with their paintbrush and pollinate everything. Nope. 
because that's a very labor intensive process when bees did it for free. We just, there are so many functions and processes that occur in a landscape that's done naturally that we humans still haven't learned to do. And when we do, we learn that it's really labor intensive and it takes a lot of time. So yeah. So when in doubt, put it back. Find out what's missing and put it back. Put it back, put it back, put it back, put it back. In my field, and what I do a lot of the times is when we have fires, we try to reduce our imprint, our, our footprint. We will move things that were built decades ago before even settlements occurred and put them closer to road corridors, place them course closer to settlements to remove what our disturbance is in the landscape to allow it to do its thing. And we exist in this little bubble, which we should do. But yeah, that's sort of what I wanted to go with. I wasn't sure exactly what you all wanted to hear about in this process. Um, but from a biologist standpoint and ecologist, just put it back. We want to use all these fancy things, but we could just put it back and not take as much. It seems like a no-brainer, but I guess people like money. Ooh. And adding rocks. Rocks. Rocks everything. <laughs> Everything's a rock. Our cell phone, that's a fancy rock. Thank you so much, Dalton. Did you have... I do, I do have some questions that came to me, because a lot of people had one o'clock meetings, I think. Oh. Um, Go ahead. Okay, so... Uh, trees, let's see. I copied it. Um, well... What I'd like to say first is I think that was perfect because I I was getting little messages that were uh, um, just we, we didn't have a representation of that consideration, which I think is really good for the team, especially working regionally. And I was thinking very much like back to the January conversation in relation to talking to these stakeholders, right? Uh, and water is just uh, anyway okay so Atri said let Dalton know this is very interesting appreciate learning about a very different perspective on natural calamities one question I would ask for him are some examples he showed such as land use planning um, is there a way or how much kind of AI or machine learning based decision making is employed in that kind of like both your movement of the what you just said I think the where to move things where things are best do you see what I mean yeah um I think that would so for AI my stance on AI is AI is just a probability calculator. Mm. It's a Bayesian way of thinking. The most likely solution is my next word. Um, and that's heavily influenced by your assumptions, your perspective, and your, your stance on things. I think AI and land use planning, we really need to look at it as if I have a house, I should, like your house, we should, that that building, that entity, this cave we built in the Midwest does not provide energy. It does not filter water. It does not uh, grow food. All these things need to be brought back in to this realm. Um, and I'm not sure how much AI will really help because it's it's understanding what the land was doing previously and then learning what we need the land to do. And in certain areas, we need the land to do a bunch of stuff. But we've, the landscape itself provides lots, every, every plot of land provides many benefits, not one sole purpose. And we continue to go out and build things that provide one sole purpose. The idea of, just office buildings, just strip malls, just parking lots, th that will be our undoing. Hmm. So all this, like my big, the biggest thing is like energy production. 
why don't we have solar panels that cover every roof? California recently passed a law and lots of them are happening. Why don't we have solar panels that cover our roads? Why don't we have solar panels that, um, or wind turbines? Why don't we encourage people to rip out all of their lawns and plant things again? Um, yeah, I, I think that's my best response to that question. We just need, we can't live in a world where the land is allowed to do one thing. It can't do one thing. It's never done one thing. Rocks do one thing. They exist. And filter and stuff. <laughs> Somewhat. Some of them do. Mm -hmm. Gotta get the right ones. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you about the uh, the solar panel thing? Um, yeah. I like the, uh, the figure that showed the different structural uh, options, let's say for solar panels. And I don't know a lot about that, but I'm wondering, um, some some of the arrangements didn't look that different. Are you aware of uh, any studies that have tried to look at the consequences of those different structural arrangements and how, you know, the trade-offs? Yes, um, there are some of those studies um, based out of, UNLV or UNR, they have a solar station or solar research station, and they do do some of those uh, studies within a landscape and different arrangements. Normally, they've been historically looking at productivity, like how many panels, you know, in which ways to get the most amount of electricity out of it. Um, however, there are some new projects currently in progress that are funded by like uh, USGS and BLM that will really look at uh, how certain things are going to affect or how these different structures might affect stuff. For instance, one of the big ones is the Gemini solar field. The Gemini solar field is like 3,200 acres or something like that, uh, or 32,000. Yeah, there's zero there. Um, and they're going to put all these solar field all these solar panels uh not like they were on the ground in that photo they're going to put them on stanchions that higher hold them higher off the ground and the reason why they're doing that is because they're going to put tortoises back in the solar fields because there's desert tortoises there normally the process is to remove them all and then it becomes a no desert tortoise area but the area they're building at is a very desert tortoise heavy area and so we're not sure how they got approved well it was the trump administration um and so they're going to put these stanchions on to hopefully put the tortoises back in there and see if they survive. Um, there have been some studies, um, but the large scale things we haven't done a lot with yet. There's still a, some of those are just uh, artist renditions of what they would like to do. But that's the so best thing. No. Yeah, um, I'm sorry I was late to the beginning, but the other. Oh no, you're fine. No, I think the um, there's a lot of interesting stuff you've gotten involved with since you've left here, so that's pretty cool. Um, I may have to send you an email and see if you present in the old restoration class at some point. Uh, I, I won't twist your arm right now, but um, when you were showing the picture of the San Bernardino, I don't know California that well. Um, it looked like. The area outside the forest, there was um, a very systematic, there you go, uh, grid, exactly. This? Why is it part of such a checkerboard? That is a remnant of the railroads. So this is BLM land, Bureau of Land Management. Um, they, this checkerboard pattern existed and it's a remnant of the railroad systems. Um, BLM hates it. <laughs> Department of Interior hates it, um, but so it's the way they, they, they bought up every other parcel or something. Yes, I'd have to look a little bit more into it, but it's like in order. It's they would sell off sections of the land for like uh, 
train substations and uh, train stations and stuff like that. Um, and it, it's just a remnant of and a remnant of the uh, way in which the land was sort of given back to the states oh. and during the Railroad Commission time. Because like this is federal land, the yeah. feds own it. Yeah. And then the white stuff is typically given to some sort of private entity, but some of these are unowned still. Um, and cool thing in consultations uh, and consulting, when we have a project that destroys native habitat, it's normally these white parcels that are purchased and given back to the state, the state or the feds. Um, I've had to walk a lot of these. Uh, but yeah, it's just a remnant of railroad times. Yeah, a policy of some sort. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they've been doing, they try their best to infill. Uh, a lot of the times uh, the state or uh, BLM will I choose certain areas and it'll be a priority to purchase land when it comes for sale in that area or to tell developers, if you want to develop this land over here, you have to purchase so much. Yeah. Um, and it depends on the species. For desert tortoise right now, for every one acre they destroy in California, they have to purchase five for conservation. Uh, Mojave ground squirrel, I think, is four. Um, and then there's things like the blunt-nosed leopard lizard, which is native to the Central Valley. If we find it on a property, they can't develop, period. There's no offset allowed. Yeah, I have to run to another meeting, but uh, I really appreciate it seeing what you're involved with. <laughs> uh, no problem. Thanks. Have a good one, Dr. Housen. All right, bye-bye. Uh, any other questions, comments, concerns? Uh, in the chat, Mara had said thank you so much and apologize about another meeting as well. Oh, no, that's uh, fine. I feel like, yeah, I want to. It was great. I, I really appreciate the. Oh, I'm going to stop the recording. Oh, sorry.